today I will be talking about something that is not commonly talked about because it is uncomfortable for a lot of people. It is about healthcare in Indonesia and not health disparity. Because if it is, the stop will stop right here. Just by showing you this graph of how, how many puskesmas or public health center that we have in Jakarta versus everywhere else in Indonesia. Or the fact that we're still seeing diseases often associated with poverty, like leprosy or filariasis, and the data is crystal clear, yet nothing much has been really done about it. So if it is not enough by just showing you the statistic, then I think it is never more urgent to show you what it really looks like from a first-hand perspective, which is what we will be doing today. And I will begin this with a story when I was working in a remote island in Maluku, K Island. One night, it was 11 p.m., and there's a lady king with a tummy ache. So FYI, the closest village to my clinic was down the hill. I thought, that must be a serious tummy ache, 11 p.m., and this lady came hiking up to, just to see me. So I went down to see her, and she's a young, early 20s, uh, lying down on a bed weekly with this kind of unnatural odd bum on her stomach. So I said, are you pregnant? And she said, yes. And there's a bias that wanted me to believe that the bum was actually from a pregnancy. But I turned ultrasound anyway, and the bum was indeed a pregnancy with a lot of blood. The bum was actually a ball of blood clot. She had a bad ectopic pregnancy. And at that very second, she's bleeding internally. In medicine, bleeding vital is important. It really gives you the chance to, to save someone's life. Uh, in that case, in this case, it would mean surgery. In this case, it would mean I had to refer her to a proper hospital because I was in another island in Maluku. So a proper hospital with blood center, which literally was a COE. Two, hour, two hours by boat if the tide is calm or if you can find a boat. And if, you know, you can, you can also find someone who can drive the boat. So I'm going to pause the story here because there's a twist to how the story will end. Uh, but it was a great description of how rural medicine is in some parts of Indonesia. And Indonesia is huge. So I know that you will argue with me, well, the story only happens in places like Maluku or Papua. You are right. Actually, we don't need to go that far. Uh, this is Bandung, the capital city of West Java, the country's third largest metropolitan city, and actually one of my favorite cities too. So 35 kilometers away from Bandung, there's a place that it's access to the nearest Puskesmas looks like this. This is not so bad at this part. I think it looks quite safe. But when you go deeper on the track, you will need to leave your vehicle behind and be very good at riding motorbike or, you know, just like me, be a, you know, good passenger. And in times when motorbikes cannot even penetrate through the track, we would have to carry the patient on foot. So in this picture, we were actually carrying a teenage boy with seizure to the nearest Puskesmas without oxygen whatsoever. No stretcher, but we kind of tried it with the sarong if you can see it and no basic life supports other than our attempt to carry the patient as fast as we can. So is this a safe mode of patient transfer? I don't know, I'm not sure. And every time I see this picture, there's something that hit me in my heart. The thing is, we medical workers coming to these villages all equipped with knowledge and skills. We are taught, we have learned and we are trained to transport a patient in the safest way that a person could do. But we are all limited by resources. So tell me if that doesn't feel like it's, you know, such a waste of knowledge and skills. And even driving an ambulance is a little bit, a little bit different too. I once worked in Los Angeles, so I knew that the ambulance would take on average less than 10 minutes to get to our ER. It's kind of not possible with this terrain that we have in certain parts of Indonesia. And uh, this video was taken in Sumatra. The other pictures before were all in Java. Now, East Indonesia will be a whole different story. Because in East Indonesia, this is the ambulance. And sometimes we will also have this smaller boat so we can go even deeper to the smaller islands. 
that blue box that you're seeing is actually, is actually where our, we will store our medicine and that uh, cut box, that's the ultrasound machine. We, we are carrying that too. And yes, I've been wondering myself too. So if access is this difficult, why don't we invest on local resources? When we talk about resources, of course, I will be thinking about human resources. It's very vital. And to answer that question, I actually look at our education level in Indonesia. And here's what I found. This is a graph showing how many students in all primary schools in, in Indonesia graduated in 2017 to 2018. Marvelously showed that 98 to 99% students completed their education everywhere from east to west. But Indonesia is globally known to have high attainment in education because the law, I mean, that's it. But when we take a look at how many of these graduated students actually continued to secondary school, it's a different story. Only a few kilometers away from Ban Jakarta, Banten, 27% of the students stopped. In Jambi, Jambi is in Sumatra, and South Kalimantan, only 66% of all students who graduated continue to secondary school. So why do these two data, which I was hoping would be correlative, were so different? There's a phenomenon that makes data collection in Indonesia couldn't be more perfect. Asal bapak senang. Or as long as you're happy, sir. Well, not all, but some are heavily geared towards just ticking off the checklist, just to make the bureaucracy look good, rather than honestly reporting what really is on the ground. That's essential. Unless it's about budget, right? Which is why looking at how damaged the facilities are is important because people will be honest on reporting if something's broken, so they will be financed to fix things. If you look at this graph, more than half of the classrooms were in perfect condition in Jakarta. But in this provinces I circle, only less than a quarter of all classrooms were in good condition. The others were damaged. Also with libraries, more than half of all libraries in Jakarta were in good condition. But Jakarta is the only province who can achieve that. So investing on uh, promoting local human resources, we know can take a long time. Another strategy will probably just to optimize the current local human resources available. And what do I mean by local human resources that we have? We have Dukun. This really translated as, uh, into shaman. He or she is a person who is believed to have the power of healing, curing, Practically, you know, do pretty much everything. And we have Dukun Anak. We have a lot of Dukun. We have Dukun Anak to help mothers giving birth, taking care of newborns and solving any pediatric problems. Uh, we have other Dukun. We have Dukun Rabies because, you know, people, people know that doctors wouldn't be able to do anything with Rabies. And we have the other specialties too. I have to emphasize though that most of the times, the Dukuns are the only health personnel in the whole island. So I am absolutely not against them. It's just that it's been proven too, all over again, that these practices can cause fatal medical problems, like neonatal tetanus, which is very sad because neonatal tetanus is easily avoidable just by having regular, regular prenatal care. It is easily preventable if subtlety is maintained during delivery and cord cutting practices, something that is very simple. And Dukun Anak are usually pretty skilled in um, giving birth, helping with normal deliveries, I've seen it myself. But when it comes to cutting the umbilical cord, usually they will have their uh, favorite tool that they will use. Most of the times it will be bamboo or a sacred stone. I don't have it here, but you can actually Google it up. Or a machete that they would use to cut literally everything from coconut meat to, you know, umbilical cord. And when asked why, they wouldn't know for sure too. But they would just say, well, that, that's just how I was taught by, by my ancestors, by my mothers, who are also Dukun Anak. So I think it's pretty clear here. What we need is a bridge. We share the knowledge and they use 
their influence to apply what they have been taught by uh, this knowledge that we share. And some of us, yes, we've been doing this uh, for some time and it's working. In 2007 to 2011, there were more than 100 cases of neonatal tetanus every year in Indonesia. It drastically went down to only 17 cases per year in 2019. And this is great, right? The bridge here is even more critical for mental and social health problems that we are facing in rural areas. Again, I will emphasize that things we deem to be controversial, we deem to be wrong in the modern society. For some people, they are actually raised to believe in that. It is their tradition, it is their belief and culture. So to completely erase that, I don't think that's wise. But it's 2020, right? And it is just so sad that we still can't find a person who are pet locked and caged in country like Indonesia, where it's richest person worth, I don't know, like 100 billion US dollars. Here, people with mental illness are often outcasted, not getting the medical or just the basic care they would need as a human being. And also other social problems too, like female genital mutilation. It is very, 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 very seldom voiced out but cannot be more real in certain parts of Indonesia. Other social problems associated with poverty, like what we are seeing here in this picture are often heartbreaking too. This lady I was seeing has been dragging herself for more than 10 years just to get around the house. And apparently buying a wheelchair, just a simple wheelchair, in these islands, it's not like ordering something on Amazon or, you know, Tokopedia. It took me literally one month to get a wheelchair sent to me in that island. And um, yeah, I had to bring the wheelchair on a motorbike too, because we don't have, we, we, there's no any car in that island. There were also so many times when we do not have basic medication, like pain meds. But one of the blissful facts that I can share with you is that adults in rural areas have higher pain tolerance from what I've seen. So as we see here, the pain medication that we have are often, you know, questionable. Should I use this? Should I not use this? You know, or expired. So it does help a lot when the patient is adult because they have higher pain tolerance, right? But what happened to kids who need painkillers? In that case, yeah, cookies work. It works so good. It's kind of my secret weapon. Ah, the, the cookies didn't work for this case though. He was eating satay while riding motorbike and yeah, he fell. And this is what I meant by just be a good passenger when riding motorbike in rural areas. So coming back to the story of the pregnant lady. She was getting worse minutes by minute. And I was thinking to myself, all right, Debrina, all you have to do is just to keep her alive until you know, in the morning. And I was sitting by her side all night long until 5 a.m. She's alive, but in a horrible condition. I told the family, all right, now, you, you know, go to the harbor now and cross the sea and go to the hospital. You know, in fact, my nurse will come with you to help you with anything. And at that point, I was feeling pretty accomplished. Oh, this is great, you know, I, I actually saved that lady. And the family was smiling, hugging me, thanking me, and said, oh, thank you so much, dog. Uh, now we will definitely rush back to our village. So I was like, no, not to your village. Go to the harbor now, go to the port. And they say, oh, no, dog, no, no, no. She has to go back to home. She has to go home and, you know, throw a cap. Apparently, there's this belief in that island that when someone is really sick, they have to throw away their bed lock by finding a black cap around their house and throw it in a predestined cliff. The cliff was actually not that tall, so a lot of cats actually survived. Um, but the family was so sure that the tummy ache and the problem that she had had to do with this cat throwing ritual because they saw the cat in the ultrasound monitor. And this is not her ultrasound. I took it from Google, but do you see the cat here? There you go, there's the cat. So I don't know, even, even just by showing and sharing these stories with you, I am reminded 
of how I often feel like medicine sometimes becomes the easiest part in rural medicine. Uh, I found myself powerless over other issues more than the medicine itself. In the practicing medicine in rural places of Indonesia, I believe this also happens to anywhere else in the world too. Feels like it just feels like you know it's just where medicine is so wrong, but at the same time also so right, because you have to do all you can to make it work, because apparently you are what you got, and you are the only one that they got to. Um, there's a common saying in Indonesian. Ya, memang kalau di daerah itu begitu. Or in English, well, that's just how it is here. It is an excuse, a bad excuse, used by everyone from all fields, not just not just medicine. And it is time to see an end to that statement, right? We, the generation often predicated to be different, millennials, generation Z, and whatever, we have to be aware of this issue. We have to understand this issue and we have to do something about this issue too. First step is we have to say that we are so over saying, ya memang kalau di daerah itu begitu. Or that's just how it is in, in rural places. This is now the time to act. Thank you.